Would you please stand for a reading of God's word this morning? Readings out of Luke chapter 5. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Genesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and the nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they bought, brought the boats to land, they left everything and followed him. And while he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he changed, I'm sorry, he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded, for a proof to them. But now, even more, the report about him went abroad, and the great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Read him God's word. Hey, good morning, friends. How we doing? You guys all right? Gosh, what a time of worship, huh? Man, just every time I hop up here, I just, I'm reminded how privileged I am, privileged to pastor this church. Hey, let's take a moment. Let's bow our heads and our hearts before the Lord, and let's pray. Father, we thank you. What a privilege it is to, to be here and be a part of this church. God, I just ask that this morning, you would, you would be glorified in our worship, in the study of your word, Lord, in the, in the way that we speak to one another, the way we act towards one another, even in our thought life, God, would you be glorified and honored in it? This morning, as we look at your word, we pray that your living word would fall on our dry bones and raise us to life with Christ. We pray that your word would do its work here this morning. And you would teach us, Jesus, the great teacher. Teach us to, to model our lives after you. Teach us to be a church that's truly full, full of your love and your grace and your mercy. So, Lord, I, I pray that any, any inability on my part would not hinder the work of your spirit here this morning. And that we would be filled by your spirit. Ready, ready to do life together in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, who do you think of when you think of a man of their word? You ever thought about that? Like, I, I was doing a quick study in that thought of a man of your word, and I, I didn't know if you know this. Here's a little history lesson for you. 1542, that was the first time someone said a man of your word. Could you imagine that? 1541, you never heard it. 1542 shows up, and like, dang, that guy's a man of his word. And you're like, what did you just say? <laughs> right? <laughs> I just think about when words come to, come to play in our, our English language. It's kind of funny. Uh, but I, I'll tell you this. I'm learning how to become a man of my word. I'm learning how. Does anyone else feel me? You with me there? You're trying to learn how to be a man of your word? I realized I didn't grow up with this being a big deal in my home. I had to learn how, and I'm learning how, to become a man of my word. Nothing has done the trick quite like having kids. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> I, uh, I had a friend visit last week, and we're so thankful for these friends. We had sent them onto the mission field. They were studying and out there in Tbilisi, Georgia. We're part of that whole team, and so thankful for them. We'd FaceTime every now and again, and my buddy Matt, he's a good guy, a really good guy, and Nathan would be on the phone in our FaceTime calls, and Nathan goes, hey, Matt, make sure before you come out to visit me in Ohio that you bring some Pokemon cards. <laughs> And uh, Matt's like, okay, I'm sure to bring some Pokemon cards. You know, my kids are infatuated, by the way. Also, I'm a 90s kid. I kind of grew up with it, too. Okay, I'm a nerd, whatever. But anyways, I remember he shows up, like, last week, two weeks ago, <laughs> and first words out of Nathan's mouth. He lands in a red eye. We pick him up at the airport, bring him home, and he goes, hey, Matt, did you remember my Pokemon cards? <laughs> I'm like, bro, if you didn't remember, now it's on me. We better run to Walmart real quick or something. Because both of us are going to be taxed by this four-year-old to be men of our word, right? <laughs> See, your word matters, right? Not just in telling the truth or keeping promises, but in a broader sense, every word that comes from our mouth matters to God, and therefore it should matter to us too, right? Keep, keep that thought as we continue our text together. Because Luke introduces a new key element in Jesus' ministry in the gathering of disciples, right? We looked last week at why people became interested in Jesus, but where, where should Jesus' mission and an interest in him lead, right? What type of people come to know him or come to him? And from chapter 5, verse 1, until chapter 6, verse 16, we're going to be looking at how the master gathers disciples, in our first portion of text this morning, we'll see Jesus answer in the picture of the miraculous catch of fish. Here's the first discipleship passage, which also is a call to mission, because those who respond to Jesus are to follow him in calling people to God. There are to be fishers of people, or from now on you'll catch men, is what Luke says, even though they, as fishers, are sinners themselves paradoxical in nature, but beautiful. So verses 1 through 3, we pick up in chapter 5, and we see Jesus doing what he does best. He's teaching. The large crowd shows that there's an increasing popularity of Jesus as a teacher, and the crowd was so big that Jesus got into one of the boats and taught the multitudes from the boat. See, Jesus had strange pulpits throughout his ministry. Now he's got a boat. He, you know, other times he's in a He's, he's on a mountainside preaching. He's got so many different pulpits, and then his final pulpit, the cross. He speaks volumes about love from the cross. Here's a portion for your Bible knowledge. You can just take note of this. That lake, Lake Gennesaret, right? You might also hear that term as the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias. All three names for the same thing. We got that here, too. You guys call, you, here in Ohio, you guys call everything a salad. I'm like, that's jello with some fruit in it. Nope, that's a salad, <laughs> you know? I'm like, okay, I guess. See, same, different name, same thing, kind of, <laughs> right? But really, it's because people lived on different sides of this lake, so they called it different things. So Sea of Galilee, Sea of Tiberias, Lake of Gennesaret, same thing. What's important is that Jesus is teaching on a lake, in a boat, to a large crowd. That's our scene. And Luke makes sure to mention to us that this is Simon's boat, right? Simon must have felt privileged that Jesus wanted to teach from his boat, right? We can also be sure that Simon listened to this teaching probably all the more attentively. <laughs> In verses 4 and 5, we see a beautiful scene here. After Jesus finishes teaching, he wanted to do something good for Simon, who had lent him his boat. Peter could not give something to Jesus without Jesus giving even more back to him. Isn't that true about our Jesus, right? You give Jesus your life, and you watch how he makes much of himself and much of your life. That's how our Jesus works. We give to him freely, and he gives everything. That's how our Jesus works. And now Jesus says, hey, Peter, let's go fishing. Probably more accurately, hey, Peter, you're, you're going to fish, and I'm going to help you a little bit. You can imagine this scene, though. Peter could have come up with a plethora of excuses, right? He'd been fishing all night, working all night. That word there is like they were hard at work. Because if you're good at something, 
and you're trying to do it really well, and then you have a portion where it's not going your way, you try real hard, you know what I mean? You know what I mean. I played pickleball a couple times and I just start smashing that ball because I'm like mad and trying really hard now. You know what I mean? It's kind of the same thing. They worked all through the night. And then Jesus shows up and they could have had a plethora of excuses. Hey, look, I worked all night. I'm tired, Jesus. Calm down a minute. I know a lot more fishing about, uh, more, more fishing than a carpenter would know, right? Like I, I, I just pipe down, Jesus. The best fishing's at night anyways. Daytime fishing isn't that great here. All the crowds, loud teaching. Hey, it was awesome stuff, Jesus, but you scared the fish away, right? Over and over, he could have had excuses. Jesus, you may know about, a lot about religion, but you don't know fishing. But Peter seemed to know something about Jesus that we should learn also. It's that all excuses fall short in the face of Jesus. All excuses fall short in the face of Jesus. We talked about this idea of bowing the knee a couple weeks ago, right? And bowing the knee in the temptation of Jesus was, was something he wasn't willing to do. But let me, let me turn your attention to Philippians chapter 2 real quick. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 9, says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hey, if that's not highlighted, underlined, asterisk, something in your, in your Bible, turn to it, get after it. That's a portion of text you need to know as a Christian. See, the Bible has very few but certain black and whites. You know what I'm getting at here? Black and whites. It's, it's either this way or it's that way. And this is one of them. Every knee will bow at the name of Jesus. You have choices here. You really do. But there's no excuse for sin in the face of Jesus. Your choice is you accept payment for that sin. Stand in the righteousness of, of Jesus before God the Father, and you bow the knee in, in reverent glory to your king. Amen? You with me this morning? You also have an opportunity in utter humiliation to pay your own price for your sin. And you will bow to me, I assure you. You will bow to me. It's a black and white. I choose, I choose to bow the knee reverently before my, my great God and Savior, Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ. See, the Bible is few but certain black and whites. And here we see, G, uh, we see Peter's great statement of faith before Jesus and his trust in Jesus' words. See, God's people throughout all ages have lived and gone forth with this confidence in the word of Jesus. He's a man of his word. He keeps his promises. But you have to see how great a word that Jesus has. See, at the word of Jesus, there was light. At the word of Jesus, the sun, the moon, the stars, all planets were created. At his very word, life came to this earth. At his word, creation is held together and sustained. At the word of Jesus, empires rise and fall. History unfolds his great plan. That's the power of the word of Jesus. In verses 6 and 7, we see that miraculous catch. See, Peter didn't make such excuses, and his faith in Jesus was well rewarded. Peter understood that he, he probably knew more about fishing than a carpenter, right? And that he had worked all night without any results. That's true. The only reason why Peter did what Jesus asked was because he believed in Jesus, not because the circumstances seemed right. See, that's, that's key for us, friends. If the circumstances have to be right for us to put our faith in Jesus and believe in Jesus and follow Jesus, guess what? It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. It's the same way, like, when people ask, like, hey, when's the right time to get married? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Is your 401k up? You got a steady job? That, that could all change tomorrow. So I don't know. I don't know the right time. But I do know that if you're waiting for the right circumstances, also, by the way, there's wisdom there. If you're a teenager sitting here and you're like, see, I told you, Mom, that's not what I'm saying, okay? Get a job. Gosh, get a job. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But... <laughs> 
But there's a reality there of, well, if you're waiting for the right circumstances, it's never going to happen. Here's an application point for us. When Jesus directs our work, it makes all the difference. See, that's what's happening in this scene. He's toiling and toiling, going after uh, hard at work, but we can work, even work hard for a long time with no results. But when Jesus directs our work, we see results. And we always miss something great when we make excuses instead of allowing Jesus to direct our work. Notice this in Psalm 127. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It's in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Thank you, Jesus. See, Peter had to work with others to get the job done. Others jumped in to help. The other boat even comes in to help. And Peter doesn't say, hey, this is my fish, my turf, my miracle, step off. Could have easily, I mean, I've seen it. Oh, goodness, I've seen it. But he signals to his partners, he calls them, in the other boats, and asks for help. And they came to help. See, this story, this portion of it, reminds me so much of the beautiful work of church, right? The, the kingdom of God, if you will. I'm not at war against other churches. You shouldn't be either, right? See, I, I'm going to use us in this joke, and I'm going to preface by saying it's a joke so you don't, you know, get offended all the way through. Here it is, though. Guy dies, ends up at the pearly gates, standing before Peter, and Peter's giving him a tour of heaven, right? And he goes, hey, opens the first door, and there's a bunch of guys in suits and ties, and he goes, these are, these are the Southern Baptists, all right? Closes the door, they move on to the next door, they open it, there's people swinging from chandeliers, he goes, these are the Pentecostals, all right? <laughs> Closes the door. He goes to third door, and before they open it, they go, Peter looks at him, he goes, shh, this is Friends Church. They think they're the only ones here. Be very quiet when entering. <laughs> See, at every single church, I've inserted their name, so please don't be offended. It's just the reality of when we do church our way, we think, man, those people can't be saved. They're doing it totally different. Or, even worse in my shoes, you try and enact some change, and they go, that's not the way we've always done it. How dare you lead us astray, <laughs> right? It's like, oh, Lord, have mercy on us. Please continue to lead your church, capital C Church, that's existed for, for millennia. If we think that we could come against the work of God in a way that would destroy it, oh, we must be sorely mistaken. But there's a reality that we have a privilege to work nicely with others. Hey, let's start here. Let's start in our church, our people, playing nice with one another, and then we'll branch out after that, okay? I'm, I'm, I promise you, it is not a problem that God has other churches in our city. <laughs> it's not. It's a huge blessing to have partners in the work of the ministry. Amen? You with me? All right. Hey, verses 8 through 11, we're going to look at Peter's response to the teachings. I want to pull out two key portions here. First and foremost, he fell down at Jesus' knees. See, Jesus had already miraculously healed Peter's mother-in-law. Yet there was something about this miracle at the blessed catch that made Peter worship Jesus and surrender himself. I think there's something beautiful when God meets us in our circumstances. There's something very special about that. I mean, your mother-in-law's fever, eh. Could have been nice if you never took it away, Jesus. No, I'm joking. No, 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 I'm joking. That wasn't Peter's response. But, hey, it didn't turn him. It didn't turn him. What turned him is, Jesus, I know everything about this field. I'm a captain of my own ship. I've got all these people working for me. But notice his words. He says, but master, master, recognizing, hey, you're the captain here. At your word, I'll let down my nets. There was something special and unique about him meeting Jesus in his day-to-day. -day. Remember we talked about integrity in the ordinary and how that makes our God look extraordinary? Well, sometimes, sometimes our extraordinary God meets us in our ordinary and calls us to him, calls us to him. And that's what we're seeing here. He falls at Jesus' knees because he sees, man, 
you, you have met me in a way that I have never seen before in such humble, beautiful ways. Second, he recognizes something. He says, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. See, when Peter saw the great power of Jesus displayed in Jesus' knowledge in an area where he should have had no knowledge, it made Peter realize his own spiritual bankruptcy compared to Jesus. Because Peter was such an experienced fisherman, and because he knew how unfavorable the conditions were, he knew all the more what a great miracle this was. Peter had hardly met Jesus, yet he already knew much about Jesus. And because of that, he understood some things about himself. One, Peter knew that Jesus was Lord, put him in his rightful place. Notice that transition. First, he calls him master, like you're the captain of this ship. And then he sees the miracle and he starts calling him Lord. Key there. Peter knew that Jesus was Lord. Second, Peter knew that he was just a man. But one step further, Peter knew he was a sinful man, which makes Peter a humble man. See, that's when we're in the face of Jesus, when we take Jesus at his word, our response always becomes a response of humble faith. We might say that Peter's prayer was good, but there's an even better prayer he could have prayed. Come nearer to me. Come nearer to me, God, for I am a sinful man. Come nearer to me. See, this, this is something you can ask all the staff because I was talking about it all stinking week. This response of Jesus was so tough for me. Jesus looks at him and says, don't be afraid. And I'm going, why would, why would Peter be afraid? He's got all this fish. He just noticed a miracle. He's got all these things happening in his life. So I did my homework for you, and then I prayed, okay? Jeez, I know, kind of a miracle in and of itself. But here we go. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. See, in the grammar here in ancient Greek, it's literally, he's telling him, stop being fearful. It, he's calming an existing fear that's happening in Peter. Peter was afraid of Jesus in the sense of holding him in awe. You have to realize there's a cultural setting here. Remember Moses in front of the face of God. And the face of God is a huge theme throughout the Bible. But a Jewish thought culturally was, if I see God, I'm dead. I'm a dead man. And so we're recognizing for the first time in the scriptures, in Luke's gospel that is, where we have a disciple who's looking at Jesus and saying, I know that you are God. I know that you are God, but my response isn't like, wow, great, I get to hang out with God. It's like, I'm a dead man. That's their cultural baggage that they brought to the table in meeting Jesus. See, Jesus didn't force that. Instead, Jesus meets him in that fear and says, hey, stop being fearful. You may bring a bunch of cultural baggage to the table in meeting Jesus, and that's okay. All of us do. And if you don't, man, you just wait. Just wait until you start just spending more time with Jesus and he works some of that stuff out of your heart and out of your mind, out of your workplace. You start realizing, I've brought some baggage into this relationship, Jesus. <laughs> but he's, he's right there to meet you in it. Because God wants to relate to us on the principle of love. Not the principle of a cowering fear. There's a trust we build on the principle of his love that brings us back to his teachings, which brings us back to his word and brings us back to a right relationship with Jesus. Are you with me this morning? All right. He says this, from now on, you will catch men. You may have heard it in the other gospels, I make you fishers of men, or all, you know, this is the way Luke's gonna say it. So when Jesus told Simon, Peter, that he would catch men, he told Simon that he would do what Jesus himself did. See, Peter was recognizing that. There's a huge catch of fish but it was more than a catch of fish. He caught Peter's heart. He caught Peter's heart. And church, you got to realize this is, this is something that we do as well. We're called and commissioned to do this. Notice the way we'll do it, though. Because you keep them how you catch them. You have to realize that. You keep them how you catch them. You want to you wanna use big things to catch people? You better keep doing it or people are gone. The way in which we as a church will catch them is by the word of God empowered by the Spirit of God, doing the work of the ministry. I'm not going to put on an event that we can't put up with over and over and over again. It's the reason why we have certain things we do. Guess what we'll do big? Easter. We'll do Easter big. Why? 
It's a pretty, pretty big event in the life of a church. We can do VBS big. Why? Because I love kids, one. But two, because I believe that we'll keep them how we catch them. Our church, we're known to invest in kids. If you got kids here, give me an amen. You know our kids' ministry is rocking right now. You know what I mean? And we'll keep them how we catch them. We're not gonna, we're not gonna put on some event that we can't keep up with. Because I'm not here to draw them by an event. I want to draw them by the word of God. I want to keep them how we caught them. And Jesus is doing that same thing. He did the miracle, absolutely. But notice how his attention, Peter's attention isn't even on the fish. They pull it in, they haul it in, and he falls at the feet of Jesus. He caught his heart. See, that word catch signifies to catch something alive. That's true evangelism. It isn't to bring dead people into a building, but to bring real life to a dying people. Amen? They, they forsook all and followed him, it'll say, or they left everything and followed him. That's how I know it. Peter didn't want anything to do with the fish at that point. He knew. He had the real substance behind it. They followed him in the way that students followed their teaching rabbi in those days. In some aspects, Jesus offered them a traditional education, if you will, at the feet of a rabbi. And in other aspects, this was going to be a very different form of rabbinical education. <laughs> They start out relatively untrained and, unge and uneducated, right? But Jesus taught them. I, I'm, I'm fighting against a thought here, if you will. Their education and training, it comes in a form of apprenticeship more than a classroom setting. But notice that many times they'll get the classroom setting. They'll be in a synagogue as Jesus is teaching, right? Here's, here's what I'm getting at here. We are called as a church to train and develop Christians the same way Jesus did. That's the model. That's the commissioning. And that's true. But notice what they do. They encounter a man of his word, the teacher, who trains and develops them through the teachings into great men of faith. It's a three-year journey of them learning under the master himself. Because I get this question all the time. Why do we have seminaries and colleges, Bible colleges, if we have the word of God and we have the Holy Spirit? Well, because even the apostles had a teacher, okay? We need training, training in righteousness. I get this statement all the time, and here's, here's my little rant for you, if you will. And if, if it ruffles feathers, hey, I just want to let you know again, please, come talk to me face to face. I don't want an anonymous letter. We can talk, okay? I love you. I get this statement all the time, Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough for what? What, do you, what, do you, what does that even mean? That's barely a sentence, Jesus is enough. Okay, so I'm going to deal with the trauma and troubles of life, and you're going to, again, throw that Band-Aid little thing over me. Jesus is enough. What are you even saying, you know? It's my own pet peeve here. Because what I know about Jesus is the prayer of Paul. I know a Jesus who's able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than I can think or ask. My Jesus isn't enough. My Jesus is exceedingly and abundantly more than I can think or ask. I don't want to hear Jesus is enough. I want to see a people, and what I'm getting at here is a people who are in love with a real Jesus that meets real needs in real time, because that's what my Jesus does. He doesn't call people to sit in pews and then just throw Bible verses at each other to defend each other or attack each other. That's not what happens. Hey, if I've looked at you at any point during this rant, I'm not talking about you. I want you to know that. I love you. You're just one of my, one of my faces in the crowd to stare at to make my point, okay? I love you, Kim. <laughs> Wasn't you? <laughs> she waved at me, all right? It was <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not that. I'm not here to condemn you. I promise you, it's not my job. That's the Holy Spirit. Way above my pay grade, okay? But I am called to exhort you and teach you the Word of God. And part of that is this. We use the Bible, I already talked about that, we, you know how we use the Bible, that was last week, go back and listen online if you want it, but this week, Jesus sets the model for us to train, equip, and develop men and women of God for the work of the ministry. We as a church are called to disciple in this way, that is great commission mindset in action, from now on, you'll be catching men, are you with me? Hey, verse 12, we're shifting gears here. Verses 12 through 16, we're going to look at God in the form of Jesus Christ reaching a leper. Now, if you're not understanding leper or leprosy, it's, 
In the ancient world, leprosy was a terrible, destructive disease, and still is in some part of the world, by the way. But this man is found being full of leprosy. This man had no hope of improvement. So he came to Jesus with a great sense of need and desperation. For these reasons, leprosy was considered a picture of sin and its effects. Why? Because it's contagious. It's a debilitating disease that corrupts its victim and makes him essentially dead while still alive. But this is where they went wrong. As a society and religious people, they scorned lepers. Even rabbis, they especially despised them and saw lepers as those under the special judgment of God, deserving no pity or mercy. But nevertheless, the leper came to Jesus by himself and despite many discouragements. See, this is what you have to realize. He knew how terrible he was, how terrible his problem was, that is. He knew most everyone thought his condition was hopeless. He had no one who would or could take him to Jesus. He had no previous example of Jesus healing a leper to give him hope. He had no promise that Jesus would heal him. He didn't even have an invitation from Jesus or the disciples. He must have felt ashamed and alone in that crowd. See, the leper had no doubt of the ability of Jesus. Notice his words. He says, he questions, Jesus, are you willing to heal and cleanse me? This is significant because the leprosy was so hopeless that healing a leper is compared to raising the dead. Yet this leper knew that all Jesus needed was to be willing. This leper wanted more than healing, though. He wants cleansing, not only from the leprosy, but also from its debilitating effects on his life and on his soul. Why am I beating this to death? Let me tell you. At some point in facing the teachings, facing Jesus, the teacher, you come to this same realization. The realization is that I too am a great need of healing and cleansing. I am in great need of healing and cleansing. And I know that at your word, God, you can bring healing and cleansing. Do you feel your condition is hopeless this morning? You feel that nothing, nothing can take you of our, apart from the shame and guilt that you're facing this morning? Jesus stands ready to heal you, to speak hope in your hopelessness. He stands ready to heal you. All of his promises are yours. And he gives them freely, even though it costs him everything. That's my Jesus. What I love about this story, when Jesus heals here in verse 13, it says he puts his hand out and he touches him. Notice the first miracle we saw. Jesus didn't even speak. He, he didn't even have to wave his hands. There was no magic happening. There was nothing like that. He thinks it, and fish appear, right? But yet he touches the leper to heal him. Why do you think he does that? Here goes my water. Why do you think he does that? I think it's because Jesus, at that moment, realized there's a man who views himself as untouchable. And yet our Messiah, our great God, wants to love him in such a way that he, he actually puts his hand on this man. Do you know how long it's been since he's had human interaction? you know how long it had been? How, how, how disgusting and shameful he, he felt in this world, and yet Jesus, our Jesus, meets him right there. Our God chooses to meet us in compassion and in love. He chooses that. We must see our condition as desperately as this leper saw himself. We'll never see our great need for a savior. Touches him and says, I'm willing. Both his words and his touch, Jesus is showing that in fact he is willing. He showed the leper more than his power to heal. He also showed his willing and compassionate heart to heal. Because I think this, it's, it's, it's easy to doubt the love of God even if we don't doubt the power of God, right? Like, I, I truly believe this. God can do anything, right? Another one of those blanket statements. Jesus is enough, right? God can do anything, and that's true. He's all-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, all the things. I, I can give you the theological riot act, right? Like, I got you. 
But love is different. Love is when those thoughts of God who can do anything and everything can do it for me. See, that, that's where my doubt comes into play. I think that's where most of our doubts come into play. It's not that God can do it. It's can he do it for me? And this is Jesus saying, I'm willing. I'm so willing. Come to me. He even puts out his hand and touches him. In verse 14, I love this, Jesus tells him to testify, but he tells him how, right? Often, Jesus commands people to be quiet about a healing or some miraculous work. Have you noticed that in the scriptures? He asks them to be quiet about it. I think he does this because he wanted to calm the excitement of the crowds, really. I don't think he's there to be this performer. He really wants them to come to hear the teachings. And they do, they come to hear, but... I can't can't help but feel the same way. Like, I would want to see the miracle, right? Jesus' miracle were not primarily calculated to make him famous or a celebrity, though they certainly did give testimony to his ministry. I think Jesus healed to meet the needs of specific individuals and to demonstrate the evident power of the Messiah in the setting of love and care for personal needs to humble people. See, Jesus commanded him to give a testimony to the priest. And what a testimony it was, right? The Mosaic law commanded certain sacrifices upon healing a leper. And when the man reported to the priest, they had to perform the ceremonies that are found in Leviticus chapter 14, if you want to study further. But they're rarely, if ever, practiced, right? Going to the priest also helped to bring that former leper back into society, See, God is a part of holistic healing. What I mean is that all parts of the human being. He heals his disease, but then restores him into society. See, that's part of our mission as a church as well, is to do what Jesus has done. To be a people for that person. Not just, okay, you've met Jesus, be warm and be filled, have a great life, get out of our church. But hey, we're a people gathered around you that want to be a part of restoring you. I believe that's a mission of Jesus. Jesus wanted the healing of this man's disease just as much as he wanted all the benefit from his life. He wants all the benefit from his life. In verses 15 and 16, we see Jesus rightfully placing fame and withdrawal in its proper places. Watch. The news of the remarkable healing of the leper became widely known. And Luke doesn't tell us specifically that the leper does it, but Mark did. In Mark chapter 1, Uh, Verses 44 and 45, it says that the leper couldn't keep his mouth shut. And he went and told everybody about the miracle, right? And it's kind kind of paradoxical, at least in my mind. You have a leper who's commanded by Jesus, don't tell anyone about this. And he tells the whole world. And then Jesus does such a great work in our lives and commands us, tell the whole world, and seldomly are telling anybody, right? Again, I'm not condemning. Not my heart. Don't care to condemn you in this area. I just really believe that there's an exhortation here for us. A call to us that says, man, if God has truly healed and cleansed your life, tell everyone. Tell everyone how good your God is. Amen? Your life should say it. Your thoughts should say it. Your words should say it. Everything in your life should say it. Tell everyone. Even in the way you do or do not post comments on social media. <laughs> do, tell everyone. Do or do not. Your, your actions one way or the other can help in this. See, Jesus had a great following as a healer, but he never seemed to promote or encourage it. The crowds came to hear, it said, and then he also healed them. In the increasing season of popularity and publicity, Jesus made a special point here to withdraw into the wilderness for prayer. The demands of life push Jesus to pray, not from it. I love that. I can can use so many things in my life that push me away from prayer. Or like, oh, my my schedule is busy. I I can't, I don't have enough time. One of my favorite quotes of all time, I don't have it up for you, is Martin Luther. You know him? Yeah. So Martin Luther, he said this. He goes, I have a busy day coming up. I'm going to wake up four hours early and pray. I'm like, give me a break, buddy. Who's got that? My day starts at 6, so I'm going to wake up at 2 a.m. to pray? That was a bit convicting, I'll be honest with you, to read his, his thoughts. I'm not asking you to wake up four hours early to go pray. I'm asking that you would 
in busy circumstances, be pushed towards prayer and not from it. Why? Because the love in the eyes of God compensated for the hate in the eyes of men. That's the point. The love in the eyes of God compensated for the hate in the eyes of men. That, that's what prayer does. It causes us to focus on things that matter and block out the things that don't. It causes us to hear correctly, right? If you come to hear Jesus, you need to hear correctly. My final story for you today, which by the way, I tell a lot of David's stories because David enjoys when I tell his stories and Nathan tells me, hey dad, don't tell a lot of my stories, okay? I'm like, all right, he's four, I won't tell a lot of his stories, but David loves it. So there's one time I'm with David and we're at the nurse's office because he has a hearing test. His first hearing test, and, well, post-birth and all that, you know what I mean. And he's sitting down, and the nurse goes to put the earmuffs on his head and says, David, when you hear a noise, can you just lift your hand up? And he nods, like, yeah, he gets it. Puts the earmuffs on him. A minute goes by, like a full minute. And those are like microwave minutes to a three-year-old, you know what I mean? They're long minutes. And she goes, hey, Dad, would you put your ear next to the earmuff? And I, uh, yeah, I listen in, and I'm hearing it. And she goes, do you hear anything? Like, yeah, yeah, I hear it. So she lovingly takes the earmuffs off, earmuffs off of David and says, hey, David, did you hear any noise? He goes, no. So, okay, well, let's try it one more time. And if you hear a noise, would you, would you put your hand up, please? And he goes, yeah, here, here's the thing. I can't hear anything over the beep, 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 beep. We lost it. I just absolutely lost it. Like, David. Okay, hey, when you hear the beep, can you put your hand up? Yeah, he put the headphones on. Beep, beep. And he's got the whole thing down, right? Oh, man. One of the, I've, never, I've never seen a nurse turn that red in my life. That was so funny. But here's the thing. It's true, right? We can, we can hear without hearing correctly. I'm going to invite the worship team up. Here's the thought. When we pray, this is why prayer matters to your life. It focus us, uh, focuses us on what we should be hearing. If you want to hear from the Lord, you cannot evict prayer from that. Yes, prayer is a conversation with God. If you want to hear prayer 101, sure. But let's go 102, 103. Let's build on that. My prayer life needs to be focused on this idea of, God, I'm aligning my will with your will. I'm hearing correctly from you when I'm aligning my will with your will. That's what Jesus is doing in the garden, by the way. He says, not my will, but your will be done. Why? Because prayer does that. It focuses us. It allows us to hear the things that matter. And here we see Jesus withdrawing from the crowds, balancing his life of busyness and rest in God. See, I told you I'm learning how to be a man of my word. And it's so crucial to me now as a Christian, I promise you that. It didn't mean much to me before, but the reason why is because Jesus is a man of his word. Through all of his teachings, his miracles, all that he was stemmed from deep conviction and deep truth. In essence, this passage challenges us to trust in Jesus' word. Acknowledge our need for his healing and restoration. Bear witness to his transformative work in our lives, and to prioritize communion with God the Father through prayer. As we strive to become people of our word, may we also become steadfast disciples of Jesus, following him in faith, obedience, and prayerful communion with the Father. Let's worship together.